because I read this paragraph quite a few times before this, and I still can't figure out actually what the hell it means. <laughs> so, Namika Gupta Wigger is the rector and chief curator of the Museum of Contemporary Craft in partnership with the Pacific Northwest College of Art in Portland. Namika, thank you for being here tonight. She's going to be facilitating a conversation between Josh and Kate, and she's going to introduce them tonight. <coughs> So, um, a couple of sentences about Namita. Uh, through curatorial practice, Namita considers how craft and design function as subjects and verbs, as simultaneously distinct and intersecting practices, and how the exhibition functions as site and space for cultural inquiry. Now, that sentence completely <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you guys figure this out. I think I think Navita is a fascinating woman who is really talented and really smart and really interesting. And I think um, you guys are going to really enjoy the way that she's going to facilitate this conversation. But in the long bio about Navita, the thing that I found most interesting is that in 2012, she was the first scholar from the United States to present a keynote lecture at. The Schmutz Symposium, Summerhof. Schmutten, Julian. I love that. <laughs> Schmutz Symposium. <laughs> A symposium of Schmutz in Germany. <laughs> Which happens to be one of the oldest conferences that get to Kampfer's Contemporary Art and Jewelry. So, with that said, please uh, welcome Namita and Josh and Kate tonight. And thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. And thank you all for being here. Thank you for that introduction, and I would invite all of you to come to the Museum of Contemporary Craft if you haven't, and uh, we can talk about how craft and design function as subjects and verbs and intersecting practices and all of that kind of stuff. Um, so I'm really excited to, to help facilitate this conversation, although I think all of us would agree that Josh and Kate probably can have great conversation on their own. We decided that it would, it would, they invited me to come and I'm really honored to be here because they are both people who I admire very, very much. So I'm going to introduce each of them and then my job tonight is to take conversations we've had. Uh, we had a, a very good conversation just recently where we kind of just talked about different kinds of things and I pulled some questions from there. But in addition to that, just thinking back through the years that I've known them both, uh, and the experiences and the impact that I know they both really had. I'm going to try to steer the conversation just a little bit to get at a couple of key issues, and then at the very end, we'll open it up for you all to have some time to have some questions too. So, with that, I'm going to introduce Josh first. And in 1991, a handful of artists and writers in Portland started Plasm Magazine. At that time, only 7 million people had cell phones. I didn't want to give my sixth grader one, but he's, he had one. He turned the sixth, well, he became a sixth grader too. Um, and the internet was largely populated by scientists and programmers. How many people here remember before the internet? Okay. <laughs> 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 I mean, I'd ask that and it would be very many people in the room. Um, five corporations controlled most of the mass media, and Plasm's Josh Berger and Nico Cortellis believed that believed then that design could be a catalyst for change in the world, and they still do. And today, Josh Berger is the art director of Plasm, now a nonprofit publication, and a senior creative director at Liquid Agency in Portland. Uh, the complete catalog of Plasm magazine resides in the permanent collections of SF MoMA and the Denver Art Museum, and examples of the pages surround us uh, downstairs in our conversation uh, and in the exhibition that prompted this conversation that we're having today. In 2012, Josh also exhibited a small selection of his work at the Museum of Contemporary Craft in conjunction with the very first Design Week Portland in our community showcase in the lab. And uh, we do have copies of Plasm available at the gallery store as well because we felt it was a very important part of Portland's history to have Plasm in the museum, uh, the museum itself. Kate Bingaman Burt is an illustrator and educator, and today marks the eighth anniversary of her daily drawings and the conclusion of this long-term project. So I know when I say that, you'll have 
questions about that too. Kate has been making work about consumption since 2002, and uh, she's explored this through zines and two books in particular published by Princeton Architectural Press, Obsessive Consumption, What Did You Buy Today, and What Did I Buy Today? She began teaching in 2004 and is currently an assistant professor of graphic design at Portland State University. And in 2010, Kate and Clifton Burt co-curated Collateral Matters for the Museum of Contemporary Craft and most recently participated in Jason Sturgill's residency where she created drawings of objects from the museum's collection and uh, the prints, the risograph prints from that project are available at the gallery store as well. So with that, I'm just going to jump in right at the very beginning. And uh, I, Josh, we talked about how you became a designer in the 1990s, was sort of the moment when you came into, into your work. And uh, we talked a little bit the other day about this really important critical shift that happened in the 1990s, that there was this moment when the designer as author started to become uh, part of discourse, part of the way things were shifting and the way the designer's role was in, in, in society, but then also we talked about how um, there was a particular aesthetic that was prevailing, a very slick aesthetic. And so thinking about those things, can you start talking, start us off by talking a little bit about how you became a designer and what was happening in the 90s that made you make work in the way you <laughs> well, thank you, Nina, and thanks for the introduction. And, uh, yeah, what, what, I mean, I knew I wanted to be a designer in high school in the 80s. I remember distinctly going to the, the career counseling office and looking up graphic design. I don't know whatever prompted me to want to do that, but I knew it's something I wanted to do, and I studied it. And then after college, I, just met. I met. There, there was also the con, the context. Nineteen ninety one. It was like the invasion of Iraq, number one. And I remember, uh, as you said in the intro, the media was a lot different then. I remember going to giant protest in San Francisco, and uh, you know nobody uh, not did not be reported on the court. You know, so things were very much more tightly controlled. So that, that was one of the reasons to start a magazine. You know, and there's lot, there were lots of things that were influencing me. I mean, there were lots of there are other magazines that in design and design you know, and a gray, of course, and, uh, beach culture and things like that were out there. And so the design was starting to become democratized in a really interesting way. Uh, and I, I would say even. It really is, you'd have to go back to Gutenberg and the invention of the printing press to find such a wide democratization of technology. So there was a lot of experimenting going on. And it was, the, the old guard was, you got to do things this way, and it's modernist, and so on. There's, you know, Griggs. And, uh, the, as uh, Massimo Vanelli famously called emigre, uh, a blight on the clean grid of modernity. You know, I mean, eventually he designed a poster for them too. You know, he realized that they actually really cared about type design. You know, but uh, so you know, there was a lot of cross currents. Does that answer your question? It does, and it also um, before we get into your, how you became a graphic designer and why you do what you do, it also makes me think about some of the other publications that you mentioned. Um, you mentioned before, like Ray Gun, and um, I was just curious, was there, was there something new in the West Coast that you were looking at as opposed to Well, Emigre is, Emigre is West Coast yeah. for sure. There were lots of, lots of zines, Staples and Xerox zines, you know, there were things like that. So, that, I mean, locally, there was stuff like Snipe Pipes, you know, and, you know, so there were cool, that it was, it was more, for me, about the act of making something and putting it out into the world. I distinctly remember, like I have a visual picture, I see Charlie laughing about sight <laughs> you know, it, yeah, I remember one cover where they used the Sherman Williams logo. I don't know if anybody would know what the Sherman Williams logo It's like the, the world and it's being covered with paint and their slogan is covered with earth. It's like 
got to be, I mean, somebody's got to rebrand that company, right? <laughs> <laughs> the worst ecological, like, I mean, so flippantly, like, cover the earth. <laughs> but I remember they used that as like the full cover, and I, I thought that was awesome. What a great cover! Yeah. So there were there were things like that, but even stuff from uh, I from the UK was also something that I was looking at as a designer. And when you look at things like Emigre and I compared to stuff like Communication Arts, Communication Arts, I remember my mother-in-law giving me some old like 1960s copies of CA, and I looked through them and. They're amazing, but then I realized, well, they're just doing the exact same shit that they did today, that they're doing today, that they did 30 years ago. Like, wow, really conservative. They're still doing it today. Yeah. <laughs> it's not, not that there's anything wrong with it, it's just, it's uh, safe. So how did you get started? Well. I went to school uh, at a very, very small college in Branson, Missouri, and um, I had no idea what I was doing. I was a mass comm major, and then I quit that, and then I was an English major, and I thought that was fun because I liked to hang out with people, and I liked people to major, and just talking, 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 and that was fun. And then I was taking all these ceramics classes because I liked the people in the ceramic studio, and it was fun to hang out with those people down there. And um, we, the, the, the art department, got a new graphic design professor like my third year of college and he was hanging out in the ceramics area and he saw me down there making just really terrible hand built ceramics and I was just like throwing just terrible shit on the wheel but it was really fun because I thought the boys who ran the ceramics studio were cute and it was you know it was a good major so far but um, he, he saw me and he's like you should take one of my design classes I was like, okay, and so I, I signed up for Graphic Design 1, and I didn't really know what to expect because at that point, I knew communication arts, and I, I knew that kind of the logo, so this is mid-90s too, so this is like 90, 96, 97. Wired, right? Oh yeah, well that was, my, my aunt and uncle were graphic designers, but I obviously didn't pay that much attention to what they were doing, they, they, and it was, again, it was very, very, very self-centered, you know, I, you're, you're 19, you're 20, <laughs> It's, it's a very me time. Um, and uh, Marcus, my professor, he plopped in front of me a stack of plasma magazines. And I was like, what the hell is this? And it basically was what I was looking for in graphic design. Because before that, I had thought it was super corporate. I, I thought it was kind of sterile. But within the pages of Plasm, I saw that you could People were telling their own stories. You're doing your own thing. It had it had an urgency to it. It had it had um, it was it was it was so um, it was so real. It didn't feel fake. And I knew that that's the type of work that that I would love to make sometime. That is actually what was connecting me to graphic design at that point. And um, and, and so it, it gave me permission to, to, to kind of work on my own ideas and to decide to make things out of paper mache for an entire quarter, which is what I did afterwards. I have no idea why, I just felt like it. And thank God for my professor, Marcus, who was like, just, you seem passionate about paper mache. You should work with that. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, it was a huge permission giver because I saw within those pages that it was, it wasn't the it wasn't the static kind of just what I interpret at the time as just kind of unfeeling design. It it had it was telling a story. It had a point of view, and it also it also just seemed like it was something like I can it, it, again. It gave me permission to to work in a way that I feel like I've been trying to chase for the last I don't know 20, 15, 20 years. So I mean that's that's huge, and I, I feel like as an educator, like those moments where I see that happen with my own students, where they feel like they don't know what they're doing, and then you just happen to kind of like put something in front of them, and then like their eyes just kind of light up. And they're like, this is what I want to do. You just, you kind of have to let them just like go with that. And um, yeah, that's, that's what Plasma did for me. And I know that it did that for so many other people. I know for a fact that it did that for my friend Denny Schmickle, who I took design classes with as well. Because <laughs> then we just started like, making crazy type and really weird movies and oh it's a graphic design projects. We're like they're doing it in plasma. We can do it. <laughs> it was also a really great defense and critique.
critiques. Look, it was printed here. <laughs> I totally have to steal that name. Denny Schnickel? No, oh, yeah. Awesome, awesome. He's an awesome guy. He's going to show great. up in a story someday. <laughs> And you all should know that when we had a conversation the other day, Josh didn't know that about um, the impact of Lesson Down on Kate. Because so I felt like surprised. a total fangirl if I were to go up to him by myself and go, listen. <laughs> the leader here was like, okay, we're doing this for a talk. Okay, and I told the meet of the story before, so she knew it. But Yeah, yeah. Sunday. Oh, no, that was uh, extremely humbling. It's amazing, man. So glad. Wow, you did that for a lot of people. Um, like, oh, it's like, oh, cool. Plasma people. did that for well, a lot of people. Is yeah, the, you're so I should also call, I want to point out Nico, my plasma partner, and he's sitting right here in the center of this. So, we've been working on this together for two decades. back to something you were talking about, about what was inside the publication, and or what is inside the publication, the content, and tie that back into a story you were telling us the other day about in the first issue of Plasm, there was an interview with Joe Biafra, and how you got that, and it ties back into what you were saying about taking action, making something happen when the media wasn't giving you what you needed. Yeah, I mean, that's what Plasm was created as uh, by artists who were not happy with the avenues of expression that we were finding for ourselves, and so we made our own. You know, we didn't know anything about publishing a magazine or distributing a magazine or, you know, any of that stuff, but, uh, or, or interviewing people. Like, I, I mean, Jello, I, I, uh, he, he was doing a, a talk at uh, La Luna, I think it was, and I went to the talk and I, had a I just brought a tape recorder and I walked up to him after the talk and that's my interview you know <laughs> and it's like wow that's that's easy <laughs> but i mean he's more accessible than other people right but but uh, he makes himself accessible but he said something in that interview that really stuck with me and inspired me at the time he said don't hate the media become the media and i really took that to heart and i think that's what we did and that's i think that's what the whole internet revolution has done yeah. i mean we're all the media now. We're all tweeting. We're all Facebooking. <laughs> yeah, we put things out in the world. Yeah, so I found that really compelling. So thinking about that, it makes me wonder about this. This, um, you know, going back to your talk and what you, what you said before about democratization of the media, also, and, and what you just said about we all we all have access to media. Even Jen just was saying how much she likes making websites because it's out there. Do it. And just a bunch of us participated just this past weekend in uh, 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 the Art and Feminism Wikipedia Edit-a-thon. And it was really empowering to just understand how to make a wiki page and get something up there for somebody who really needs to be on there. So there, there's agency that we have now. With that digital content available, that we can create our own content, we can get all that content out. What does that do for you in terms of the content of Plasm? What does it change in terms of producing a magazine versus the other vehicles that are out there? Right. Well, I think you really have to think carefully about putting ink on paper these days. You know, like what, I mean, it used to be that uh, it was a way to get information out of the world. I mean, it still is a way to get information out of the world. But I mean, it's like newspapers is, is the place where you would get the news, you know. And now there's not, you know, nothing's going to be more current than the phone you're carrying around in your pocket. You know, there's no way that a newspaper. So that immediacy is gone. This is why newspapers are dying. Really, you know, they have to be relevant. Maybe the New York Times on digital. You know, they they, they really are doing some good things on, on a digital format. I think what the role of print is now has become much more uh, one of exclusivity, right? I had this uh, epiphany when there's a design museum in Holland that sent me this catalog, and the catalog is called uh, You and Me and Everyone You Know as a Curator. <laughs> and, 
And I thought, wow, this is an amazing catalog. I don't know why they sent it to me. It came into the land of the plasma field box, and I started reading it, and I thought, well, I'm going to look online and see if I can read you know, or see some of the talks or whatever. Nothing online. You know, there's an announcement that the symposium, the thing was happening. And I thought, wow, that's really powerful. So we intentionally don't put certain things online. When, when you're holding a copy of Plasm or really any other print magazine in your hand, you know you're the only, you're the only person, not the only person, but you're one of a limited number of people. There's a finite, digital is infinite, print is finite. So what you choose to do with that, I think is really important. There's a way to use print, and the utility of it is, uh, is not, print is not good. Not that, it's not the end of print. Carson was wrong about that. It's not the end of print. It's a different life of print. Because the intimacy of the experience is still there. I mean, you're, you're intimate with the object. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a definite, it's, you're, you're holding it. There's not a lot of pieces of design that you spend that much time with where you're you're that close with it. It's in your hands. It's close to your face. You can smell it. And, and a lot of times, like with plasm or with you're not going to throw that away either. That's an artifact. That's something that you're going to keep and just. It's, well, there's, it's a different yeah. different role now. Yeah, it's a totally different it's role. It's a different role. I mean, it's not that there's something wrong with digital or something wrong with print. It's like choose recognizing the role of each, mm -hmm. recognizing the appropriate media for the experience you want to create. In your experience because of when you came into the field is a little bit different than 1990, 1991. When I was in undergrad in the early 80s, nobody talked about, it, it just, I was in Houston. So I don't know if that was part of it. The art community was phenomenal, but I don't recall the graphic design community being particularly exciting or energizing. Certainly at Rice University, nobody came in and said, you really ought to be taking my graphic design class. <laughs> um, we were doing other things. But, but that said, you know, you came into the field in a moment when the internet and print are both part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. So how is that different for, me, for, for you, just in terms of how does that function for you in terms well, of that moment? I feel, I feel very lucky to have existed in a pre-internet world and working in a post-internet. Well, not post-internet, but like in an internet world, because I, I understand the value of both. And um, at least this is something that I try to pass along to my students, too, where it's I want them to be, if you're going to be online, be effective online. If you're going to be in print, be effective you know, with the tangible object, but know the conversation and know how both of those work. Um, at PSU, we actually have kind of, I think it's almost like antiquated tracks right now where we have this track is interactive and this track is print. And we're trying to rewrite that because it really should be like everyone should be able to have that conversation and everyone should be able to be effective and get those ideas out in any way possible. If it makes the most sense for it to be online, then really do a damn good job of having it be online. If you really want it to be this limited edition print object, then it better absolutely convey that message you want it to convey. And so, and then also like know how to talk to each other. Because I really feel like that's, I hate hearing it defined so separate because it's not separate. It's about ideas, it's about communicating ideas. And you have to be kind of a ninja in both. And, um, and so I think that's maybe maybe that's what how I came of age with the kind of the pre and then in it knowing that both of that is it's, it's just really it's really important you shouldn't see those divisions. But I love what Josh was saying about how you and it's funny too because when you brought when you were telling me about this catalog I immediately kind of was like oh it was all online you're like no it wasn't yeah. online <laughs> like oh what do you mean it wasn't all online and then I started thinking like oh I love that that. We're so used to being able to access everything online that print can be a secret for people. And it can still retain that specialness of when you, you find that, that album you've been searching for forever in the, in, the, in the bins of a thrift store. Like, it's yours. It's special. And so, like, that experience you can have with that catalog can be special. You can't just look, up, look it up online. I don't know. I like, I like that exclusivity, too. And yet, I was a curator. And a you curator, there was part of what you said that went, oh, no, you need to give the public the experience, you need to document the experience. And one of the things that I've noticed is this trend in museums over the last couple of years where the exhibition will have some kind of content and then the publication is completely different content. 
So it's not it's not functioning. I mean, the archivist in me is is going, oh my god, the record doesn't reflect what people actually saw when they went to see the exhibition. And when exhibitions are so ephemeral, the record becomes the only trace. Because mm -hmm. conversation and dialogue is not is not there. So it's interesting. It's just an interesting kind of kind of different perspective on that. But you maybe think about it in a different way, you know, also. But well, it's important to consider all aspects and and it's important to remember that nothing really exists in isolation. I mean yeah. you could say that that's just the way the world is. Nothing exists, everything's interconnected. Nothing exists in isolation. So you can produce, you know, 5,000 copies of this issue of the plasma and we send it out there and 5,000 people, or actually a lot less than that, probably hold on to, you know, have, buy them and acquire them. So 1,000 people are holding that, but, and they have a ex certain experience with it. And when uh, other people, when somebody goes online, they experience what we put online, they have an experience with that, everything. Is, but it's still a plasma experience. Sure, sure. The, I mean, I, that's this is kind of one of, the, one of the, this is one of the things we do here at Liquid Ag Agency is really understand the values of a brand and embody them, embody them and build them into all the various experiences, whether it's a retail experience or a print experience or an online experience product experience, they all need to still be talking about the same thing and both, you know, value and the same thing. And that makes me think about the way your practice functions, too. Um, I first learned about you, I think I first learned about your work when I first moved to Portland in 98, from looking at physical publications, and then I signed on for the emails, and. The t-shirt thing that you did was awesome, and we still have all the t-shirts. I'm on. one of the few subscribers. <laughs> <laughs> so yes. It was so cool. Well, it just, people just didn't want to be surprised with their <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was bad. It was like my husband's Father's Day gift for, for the year. So we were really sad the next year. It helped me get rid of all of those stupid old college t-shirts that we had. <laughs> but I, I first learned about your work through the internet, and it was really probably in conjunction with um, Handmade Nation mm -hmm. and that particular moment and the whole rise of DIY and, and the whole controversy in the craft community about, oh, God, the DIYers are coming and are taking over craft. And, you know, now design is taking over craft. So everybody loves I craft. Know. <laughs> but but the design but but the the thing for me with you was it was the internet. Yeah. But then at the same time, I knew that you were producing GoPro printed scenes, and and so there was this combination of hand and 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 net and all of that. Well, I, I think I think the hand definitely came first. Like that was that's something that's always going to be a part of my work. The internet came because. <coughs> I took my first teaching job in Mississippi. <laughs> and so that was in 2004. It was the very beginning of Web 2.0. And I felt tremendously isolated. Kind of like, what the hell did I just do? I, I just finished up with graduate school. My very first job, I accepted this position as an assistant professor in Starkville, Mississippi, which is northern Mississippi. And um, my husband and I thought it'd be fun. And uh, <laughs> and it was fun, but there wasn't there wasn't that I, I had a really really strong community when I was in school, and I feel like I have a very strong community here. And this is the first time being in Mississippi. I was like, I don't know where my community went. What happened? And like many things, my husband Clifton was like, hey, there's this site called Flickr. You should take a look at it. Take a look at it. So this is 2004. And I, the first thing I thought was like, why would anyone want to put their photos online so other people could see it? <laughs> I was like, that is just the most ridiculous thing. I can, no, I can't do it. And he's like, you know, you should really, you should really take a look at it and see. It's pretty neat. And then he lost interest in it. And then several months later, I picked it up and I ran with it. And that's very much been a trend where like he'll show me something I'll be like that's dumb and then it'll marinate for a while and then I'll just be like oh I love it so hard and so the the internet at that point 
was how I met so many other people who were working in a way that I was working. And so I, and I'm so, so, so very, very, very pleased to say that a lot of my friends that I met online are actually like in real life IRL friends now. And, um, <laughs> which would be the data. <laughs> But but the internet was a lifeline at that point because I, I was just I was making all this work. I didn't have my critique group, I didn't have any other voices in it, and so I just slowly started uploading it and putting it online and I found this sense of community online. And that's how I became that's how I met Namita, that's how I became involved with the the, the burgeoning DIY scene, things like that. And that's eventually, that's how I ended up in Portland too. Because I met my friend Jason Sturgill online because he had an online gallery. He lives in Portland and he's lived in Portland since 99. And he had an online gallery called The Worst Gallery. And he saw my work and I started having shows there. And then he told me in 2006, 2007, <coughs> they're looking for a, a teacher at Portland State and um, think you, you you should probably apply for it. And I was like, I don't know, I really like Mississippi. I've really gotten comfortable being online. <laughs> and Jason was like, well, you're stupid if you don't apply. I'm like, well, I don't like being called stupid. So I applied and that's how I got here. Now he's my studio mate. And so it's just like those type of relationships. Again, it's all that balance of having effectively working things online and then being able to to have that happen materialize in real life is really powerful that's that balance and it's 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 kind of blows me away and I feel like I've seen that repeated again and again and again and I try to do that with my work too where I want to effectively effectively share my work online but then I also want to have installations and create tangible experiences and have have you know uh, let me draw your stuff in person, come and tell me what you've purchased, and just have those face-to-face -face connections as well as making those connections um, in, in the internet as well. Yeah. So, but yeah, it was, it was awesome. Like, I was sitting in my studio in Mississippi, and Amita <laughs> sends me this email, she's like, hey, I hear you're going to be teaching at PSU. I'm like, what the hell is this? The internet is so cool. <laughs> so, now I'm here. <laughs> now you're here. So, I want to circle this around to the formats. And I'm thinking about the formats of the zines, the format, the, the, the aesthetic format, the structure of a publication that looks like less. Um, one of the things that I think about, um, Portland is the smallest city I've ever lived in. Um, I lived in Houston, I lived in Chicago. Before that, we were in, I was a kid in New Jersey, which is essentially the part we were in, it was like a suburb of New York. But, you know, it, it's the smallest place I've ever lived in. And one of the things that I realized um, one day when I was walking around Philadelphia Museum of Art, and I was upset that I couldn't give my children the experience with the, the Dada collection that's there, or the Sai Tuong paintings that are there. And I had to sit down and evaluate, what can I give them that's different in Portland? And the zine culture and the print, print culture here is different. And I wonder if you both might talk a little bit about that. I'm thinking about things like IPRC mm -hmm. or um, you know, uh, reading frenzy and carols and you know, just paper. We, we like paper here, and there's something different. Sure, I think that we like a lot of things that are creative <laughs> here. Yeah. You know, yeah. to me, what's interesting about Portland is the ecology. I feel like you know, Plasm could not have uh, survived in New York. You know, we never would have been able to pay the rent. We were the space, uh, our first office was like a few hundred dollars a month. It was right across from where Reading Frenzy was, you know, Ninth and Southwest Alder. And that, uh, I remember Michael Russo was you know, on the floor with him. He used to come in there with his lunchbox, like a, like a work, you know, split ones with the thermos on the side. He used to come in there every day. He was coming there for 30 years. I would, sure wish I would have talked with him more. but. You know, and so I think it's the ecology is part of it, and you could say the same about uh, independent film, music, like there are these communities that support one another and um, want to help one another create that. Same thing with beer, with distilleries, with the coffee, you know, all these, all these things, farming. 
I think it's, a, it's just the place that makes it work. The right challenge. I mean, I, I, Portland's, I mean, it's, when I was teaching in Mississippi, I definitely shared issues with Plaza Magazine with my students, and they freaked out. I told my students about Reading Frenzy, even though I've never, I had never been there at that point. And again, it's all the internet stuff. And the, when I first moved to Portland, one of the first places I went was Reading Frenzy, because I had made friends with Chloe on the internet. And so it was, and it was, it was great to actually be able to experience that now as part of my Portland life. And then the other place I went to right after that was the IPRC because it was upstairs. And now my studio is across from the IPRC. And it's just, it's kind of, it's just funny to see how those things work. But it, it, it is, is that, it is, Portland, Portland does, it's, it celebrates, it celebrates its passions really, really well. Um, and I just, yeah, it's, especially the people who love paper. Yeah. I love orders. Why make plasma look the way it does? Why design it that way as opposed to something else? And it's kind of a silly question in some sense because obviously you're going to do more. Well, we, nice, but, but it's an artistic response to the work. I mean, it's, uh, we set out with an idea of publishing things that might not be published elsewhere that were underrepresented or not represented in mainstream media, and that's evolved over time, but uh, it's always been, uh, design has always been a big part of it, and something that I, as uh, art director of Plasma, I've always encouraged that, like, we need to, uh, we would evaluate the content that came in, it's open submissions format in the beginning, it's evolved over time, we still take some submissions, but it's much more curated now, and, um, the, the work gets interpreted. It's one artist interpreting another's work. So a poem, like some of the layouts that you see on the walls down there, it's one artist interpreting another's work. And you know, like uh, the, the uh, paste up mechanical that uh, Nico did, uh, it's hanging in the lobby of Michael Nobili's poetry. It's like, it's like a poet, but not, like they might have been in like a lit journal or something. expressive in a whole new way and it really opens the door to more people and, and, and things that form one another. We put them together, we build a container, and there's no real rules like, I mean it has to be a certain, there's a page size, there's the number of colors that we can afford to print. Other than that, everything's fair game. You know, so a lot of different designers contributing, you might turn, you know, every spread might be different. Same thing with content. It's all one time we did an architecture themed issue and we got a bunch of architecture submissions after that. It's like, well, no, we're on to big. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it's not, not a good model for selling ads. <laughs> not as easy to market as golf for fashion, you know, or something like that. It's, it's really, we take a zine-like approach, the ethos of a zine, and we publish it on a really much bigger scale. It's not stapled in Xerox, it's uh, designed and produced. It's still got the same art that independent zine. It's some of the parts. Whoever's involved in a given issue, that's what the output is. And that speaks to some of what you brought up about connections and collaborations when you've done illustrations and drawings with people bringing objects to you mm -hmm. or, or the free boxes and guys like that that you work on. So it's good about snippets, there's stolen goods. Anybody has stolen anything, let me know because I'd love to draw it. So. <laughs> <laughs> Josh shared this really fabulous quote. We were talking about um, 
there's a, a hands-over gobrist, the curator has this fantastic Instagram feed where he asks artists to write different things on post-its. And um, one of them that came out on, on the day we were talking said, stop, said something like, stop, stop pretending the world is boring. Oh, you know, these are two people who are, are clearly, I mean, the world is definitely not a boring place to either of them. And it, we were talking a little about that, and Josh brought up this really fantastic quote from John Cage um, that uh, is a, from a Buddhist precept. He said, if you stare at something, and I'm going to paraphrase him a bit, um, paraphrase this John, not the other John. Um, if you stare at something for a couple of minutes, and it is not interesting, stare at it for four minutes. Mm. If it's still not interesting, stare at it for eight minutes. The longer you stare at it, the more interesting, the, then everything becomes interesting. Um, and it started me thinking about this question of as designers, when you're, you are concluding an eight year long project, you have been working with Blondie for 22 years, you know, staring at things, keeping at things, keeps it interesting and fresh. What is it that keeps design fresh and interesting for you all? Good question. What <laughs> <laughs> keeps design fresh? It's the possibility that, 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 that anything is possible. You know, it's, we're in a we're in an era where we're surrounded by information all the time. We're bombarded. We're, we've got uh, access to all of the world's information in our pockets. You know, it's, it's a huge thing. Like, but to be a de uh, designers have the ability to hopefully cut through and, and be able to uh, create effective communication. And I think that's a really important role in today's society. We're swimming in information we help to make. Because I'm justifying design or something, I feel like I'm validating. We help make communications clear. We help make communications easy to understand. We help make understandable communications. I continue, I continue to be interested in it because I'm interested in the world and I want to uh, talk about what I see. So for me, that's why plasma is uh, a good vehicle. I mean, the, the, the next issue, we're collaborating with Chris Riley and his global network to try to uh, uh, tell stories from places in the world you wouldn't ordinarily think of where stories come from. So it might be uh, Tehran, or it might be Mogadishu, or uh, we're still figuring out exactly where that but those stories will come, it's not going to be us telling the stories, it's going to be them telling the stories to be as well. It will be a container where it happens. And I think that just will illustrate what the, the uh, innate, uh, fundamental human need to create. Mm -hmm. Things. <laughs> Keep things fresh. Uh, um, I, I really, I have to, I, I feel like teaching for me helps me keep things fresh. Just, I love, I teach seniors and I teach sophomores and I love teaching my seniors but I really love teaching my sophomores because they remind me on a daily basis about how lucky we really are to be working in a creative field. Um, just seeing how excited they get over um, new paper reminds me of like, yeah, paper's really great. And I, I feel like if I were working by myself in a studio, I'd be like, oh, big deal, paper. I feel like I'd be a way more jaded person if I didn't have the kind of the really wonderful constant reminder of working with students who they hope to be working in a creative field too. And again, we're really lucky to be able to make things as a profession. And that, I feel very fortunate to be able to call design as my profession, and that I mean that keeps things fresh for me. Like I, I'm, I'm just happy to, to to make things and to talk with other people who are making things and to have that conversation. Um, it's it's a pretty lucky thing. So I just have to remind myself that. <laughs> One of the things that strikes me about 
both of your responses is you're talking about giving agency that places a lot. And I think that's a really powerful aspect of why your work continues to be important to people because you create a platform for dialogue and for, for other people to be able to, to put themselves up. One thing I feel like a, would be interesting to raise, like, well, you know, how do you do things that you love, right? Like, I mean, we love the work we do, but, you know, that used to be, like, well, you do the stuff you like on the weekends as a hobby, and you go to your job, and so I think it's an interesting thing to think about this balance. Like, I wouldn't even be sitting here if I didn't work on Plasm. I wouldn't have... Uh, gotten to work at Wyman Kennedy if I hadn't been going in. I wouldn't meet, have met Nico if I didn't start Plasm because I wouldn't have even been walking in the door there. You know, uh, uh, John Boyle was designing stuff for the magazine. Well, that's, and I end up doing this and this and this and it leads to things. And, yeah. you know, so it's a balance, but I, I guess I just want to raise it. Like, yeah, you don't have to do the stuff you like on the side. Like, you didn't set out to be an no, illustrator. not at all. Like you, I, you trained as a designer. Yeah. Now you get hired to do illustrations. And I'm so happy that that's what I'm doing. I know that I know that I wouldn't be an illustrator, and I probably wouldn't be teaching if it hadn't been for all of these consumption investigations that I've done for over the last 13, 14 years. And those all just kind of, and I just did those because I, if I didn't do those, I was going to go crazy. Like I really wanted to, I, I wanted to find out these questions. That's the stuff that I was. That's what I wanted to do, and all of that kind of led to these other things. And I'm just so fortunate that I've been able to do that. So. So uh, it's a more of a rhetorical question, but you know, how do we, as designers or artists, how do we train ourselves to follow that creative yeah. impulse and not suppress it? You know, how do we follow that creative impulse? and allow us to discover that that might. Mm -hmm. you know I, mean? I like the way you said it the other day, which was really succinct. Fuck hobbies. Make your life your hobby. Well, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think I'm going to have that on the wall. <laughs> it's, it's true, yeah. You don't need to segment these things. I mean, they're like, and I see lots of examples of people that are in the room that I know they're following the, their bliss. You find your bliss and follow it. That's how you make things that are meaningful to you. That's how you end up getting good jobs and th with mm -hmm. things that you care, doing things you care about. Your work's going to be better if you do, if you give a shit about it, yeah. right? Your work's going to be better. You're going to be happier. That's such a hard thing you know, to learn though. It's a, it's That's such a hard you, thing to realize though. I mean, I feel like I, I, I've been having conversations with students over and over and over again because they feel like they should be making work this way because that's what's going to get them hired. And it's, 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 but we're all kind of, I feel like we're all kind of trained to, like, this is what we're supposed to be doing. And well, it's the opposite. Exactly. Yes. You don't do things because you think that yeah. somebody's going to like them. You do things because you're going to like yeah. them. Yeah. And then somebody will see it and like it and hire you to do it. Yeah. And I want to bring up something. <laughs> no, it's true. It's so true. It's, it's hard. It's hard. You feel like you're operating without a net with that kind of stuff. It takes. It takes some guts. You got to trust yourself. You made me. You made me feel when I, we had a conversation a couple of days ago when I brought up something like, oh, but that I just you know that just feels like it's so self-indulgent. And I was saying it in a really like a negative way. And you're like, no, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. And that actually like, kind of like flipped my perspective a little bit because. That I me mean, again, like you're giving me permission to think that doing my own thing, it's okay. Yeah, it might be a little self-indulgent, but you're, you're 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 making the work that you want to be working. You're putting you're putting that out there. I mean, it's, it's such a balance. Yeah, you, know, you can't just do what you want all the time. No, but you know you have to balance yeah. that. Like there may be some things that you sort of have to do, but it could be a means to an end. But you know you got to take some time for yourself and indulge yourself. Take care. It's just like being in a relationship. You can't be in a relationship with somebody unless you're at peace with yourself. 
you can't have a healthy, you can't you have a good relationship if, with somebody else if you don't have a good relationship with yourself. It's the same thing with doing work. Yeah. I think you make the publications, you make the things, you put the things out there in the world that you want to see. I think the exhibitions that I want to, I want to go to, you make the work that you want to go to. Shall we open it up? Does anybody have anything that they want to ask or talk about or something we didn't touch on? Can I just give a quote like right off of what you're talking about? I heard this great quote last weekend that said, uh, I was listening to an audiobook, and the woman was like, your passion has a purpose. And I was like, that's, that's like exactly what you're also talking about. It's like, trust that. Trust that your passion has a purpose. Speaking of quotes, Kate, I can't remember, but on Sunday when we were having coffee, you had this Mike Tyson quote. Oh, uh, yeah. I, just, I, just, I, just, I, <laughs> I quote Mike Tyson. And, and it was an awesome quote. It's I don't think it was Mike Tyson. Everybody quote. has a plan until they get punched in the face. <laughs> It's such a Zen thing. Like he's, it's, it's a, that's, he's, he's like a Zen Buddhist. He is. He's a Zen master. Like, 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 because you know, everything you only have control of what you're doing right now. Yeah. And then when the breath leaves my mouth, it's in the past. Yeah. Can you talk about ending the uh, your eight year project? Yeah. Um. So. I had been drawing something that I purchased every single day for the last eight years. So I started that February 5th, 2006. Um, previous to that, I, you know, I've been doing these daily documentation projects since 2002. And so I've always like I've photographed everything that I purchased for two years. And then I drew all my credit card statements until they were drawn, until they were paid off for like about six years. And then I've been doing this illustration project for the last eight years. And it wasn't so much I, and I've, I've t whenever I give talks and people are like wanting to know how they can start their own projects, I'm always saying, you know, you don't have to wait till January 1st to start a project. You don't have to wait until, you know, if you, if you feel like you have this idea, you should just go ahead and do it. And, but it really should be coming from a, uh, a, a sincere place. It should be coming from this place because if you, this because you, it's something that you have to do, not because you think you're going to get a job from it, or not because you think you're going to get a book deal from it, but you have to do it, or you're just going to explode if you don't, basically. Well, I felt the last couple months that I'm like, I don't think I really want to do this anymore. And, um, and it, it, like, I feel like I kind of achieved what I wanted it to achieve. I felt like it kind of just kind of ran its course. And so instead of just stopping, I went against my own advice where I'm like, oh, you should just stop. I'm like, no, I want to tidy it up, and I'm going to have an even eight years. And today was the eighth anniversary of the project, and it was the last one. So, And this is actually, like, I don't have a plan for what my next long project's going to be. But um, the last time that I've been, um, like, kind of ritual project, daily-based project-free has been in 2004. It was the summer of 2004. So tomorrow... You're sleeping in. <laughs> you don't have to like stop yourself from like trying. Oh, don't worry. I still have lots of drawing I need to do. It's just not part of this project anymore. Oh, yeah, you have been drawing about the thing you want, you want to buy. Yeah, I thought about that. I thought about that. But you know, this is also something too. Like I can actually, it was very telling because um, again, like. The part of the rules of this project was it was it was you know black line drawing. I would draw the object, I would write the date, I'd write the price, and I'd write a line of just some contextual line. But it was always a price. It was always very much like kind of consumption focused. And um, and again like I've been. I find consumer culture fascinating. I find, again, the stories behind our objects really fascinating, but the, the, the money part of it is becoming less so fascinating to me. And it actually was very telling because today was the first time I drew a, the last drawing. I forgot to put the price on it. And that was the first time that I've done that in a really, really long time. And so I'm like, okay, well, that's, that's a, like, I don't really care about the fact that my iced coffee cost three bucks. Like it was, it's, it was, it's just, I don't know, it's, it's, it's not going to be, I'm not as, I'm not as interested in, in that, in that aspect anymore. So, 
But again, like that project like brought forward so many other like amazing kind of collaborations and experiences and different ways of working. And um, and I just kind of look forward to exploring those things that that project kind of gave birth to, rather than doing that that project. So. Congratulations on giving up. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It was good. Yeah, that's awesome. It was <laughs> really scary, but yeah. So, I mean, I, the, or my friend John Raymond, the editor of Plasm, is he says things like, "I'm." Trying to figure out what to give up next, oh, you know. And it's like it's a, it's like you open yourself up. Yeah, I, a, I have a lot a of clear starting clear headspace. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, did I answer your question? Okay, cool. Thanks. <laughs> so my question goes back to like more of the beginning of our conversation. But I wanted to comment on what we've been talking about now because it's super interesting and it's super contextually relevant for me because we're talking about these ideas of kind of like privacy and security and capitalism and money and reinforcement. You know, what reinforces you to do what you want to do? Is it the intrinsic value or is it something secondary? So I'm not sure what exact, exactly the question is, but just comment on, like to me it's, it, you want to do things that are meaningful. Mm -hmm. Do things that are meaningful to you, and they will have meaning to others, right? And so whether it's in print or whether it's online, you do things that are meaningful. It's the most My question thing. is about the access, though. It was like before, I mean, I mean, like print was mass media. You were a newspaper or magazine. It was published, and I mean, of course, there were regional, local, sure. and niche magazines, but it's yeah. like now most of the news is consumed by your New York Times alert on your phone, and no, you're right. The access is all, the access has totally changed, and I think we haven't seen the end of what that change will be. Mm -hmm. I think it's really in the majority world where the the change will be felt. I mean, you've got people that are in Africa that are getting smartphones. Right. I mean, they're skipping all the other stuff, right. and they greatly outnumber everybody in the so-called West. So it's like the print is becoming the exclusive media now. Print, print, is, print can be used for exclusivity for sure. Yeah. It's not, it can't be used for immediacy of information anymore. You know? I think it can, it does have a utility like local news on a newspaper. That's still a cheap way to get uh, information out into a community. So I think it's kind of possible. Lots of utilities still. How many of you get a newspaper? <laughs> <laughs> Not wow. Well. See, that's the thing. We don't, we don't take a newspaper at home. No, we do yeah. I mean, the reason we don't take the Oregonian has to do with the Oregonian. The Oregonian. That's a long story. Yeah, it's a long story. It has to do with the CD that came in the, in the paper that was anti Islamist and. Um, we got really angry, and so we were like, forget it, we're not taking the paper anymore. So we get the Sunday Times. Well, that's, um, that's, but that's, that's more, more like an indulgence. Than that's an yeah, indulgence. Yeah, it is. It's like a special <laughs> treat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to get the <laughs> <laughs> It's interesting, though, because my kids are in, in um, middle school and in high school, and when you talk with them about their, the way they receive news um, is from us or from what they happen to pick up on the internet if they happen to, to see it. So it's interesting thinking about the smartphone as the vehicle for, um, for getting information. It's, it's wide open in some ways, and yet your day-to-day -day interaction on how you get information and how you receive things is um, completely tempered in a different sort of way. And, um, you know, and I actually think probably my kids are really um, going to be kind of screwed up because they watch um, the comedy channel to learn the news and we have to explain the back end of satire to them instead. <laughs> you know, yeah, so you know, they're getting their news from... I learned most of my news references when I was their age from Mad Magazine. So I feel like it's, you know, I mean, I think it's like, it's, 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 satire is a great way to, it's like, it's a gateway drug to actually being interested in those topics. Yeah, I feel, no, it really is. And I feel like, I mean, it's, 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 yeah, so I wouldn't feel too bad. 
We're still laughing when you were talking. Yeah, I was uh, I'm curious, thinking about how I consume information, and uh, I was around before the internet. But now when I consume information that's online, I feel like I scan a lot and I just kind of take pieces. But when I sit down with an actual printed piece, I'm actually paying attention to yeah. it, right? Yeah, totally. Right. So it's almost like we could use that to its advantage mm -hmm. to actually have people who are paying attention actually focus on what they're reading or consuming and not just scanning and kind of taking pieces away from it. So I don't really have a question. It's just a thought. <laughs> speaks to what you were saying before about there are a thousand people who have copies and a thousand people have a copy. A thousand people have an intimate experience with with class and magazine or, or, or however buys your scenes the same thing. Maybe let's do one more and then I think we'll probably come to the movie. Um kind of talking about the opposite end of the spectrum, um, what you were saying about everyone being able to have a voice, like everyone has access to the internet and no one has to get something past a publisher anymore to have what they've written be read by thousands of people. How do you think that will affect what we perceive as culture, culturally relevant moving forward if no one's declared that it's good enough to publish or print or curate something? Um, so all of this DIY and all of this work that's being put forward and everyone has a blog now. Um, I guess my question is, this has sort of been something that's been bothering me for a while, is like how will we, if we can't really, we don't really have an authority that tells us like this is good, this is worth looking at, how will that really affect what we take with us into the future as far as like, what, what are our classics now or like what are our, you know, does that make any sense? <laughs> yeah. It does. It's, okay. uh, it's almost a curatorial question. <laughs> 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 well, I mean, I think that, that well, like you said, everybody's a curator now. You know, everybody's, it, it's become the way to describe filtering information and editing out and creating a context or creating a point of view. And I think that, um, it, I think it's amazing to be in a moment where you can have multiple points of view. And yes, it does mean you have to take on the responsibility of filtering out those points of view and determining what you are going to choose to listen to or not. I think the difference is now those views have access to you, whereas before they would have been in separate places and perhaps unreachable unless you were in Mukishu or Mumbai or places like that. So with that though, I think um, it, it, it makes me wonder sometimes about the role of say a librarian as a curator sort of thing, where what ends up happening is you sort of choose certain people who filter out your information for you. Um, you follow certain blogs because you know certain people who you like follow those blogs. And there's part of me that wonders if that's any different than it was before. Because you read a book because you like Josh's opinion on things, and you read the book because Josh liked the book. Do you think we have authority as consumers, or yeah. do we still listen to other people's, like even um, subconsciously? Are we just already picking out what we know we'll already like, or are we really open to? I think we operate with subcultures, and those subcultures help determine how we filter things, whether it's all the things coming at us from the internet or the way that things were before the internet. You still are operating with these sort of groups that you have affinities with. I don't know if you feel the yeah, same well, way. Well, there's a lot of different layers to this. I mean, they're, they're, we have, we're experiencing like the death of the fourth estate. Uh, I mean, there are still media outlets, like I feel like the New York Times is a good example. Like, they're embracing digital, they actually have reporters in the newsroom, having a newsroom actually, it, you know, it has certain uh, qual qualities and criteria of objectivity and rigor, you know, journalistic rigor and so on, and we all have all these uh, brands that are telling their own stories, and we have people that are telling their own stories. We need to have filters to receive the information that we want to receive. We also have these search engines that are like uh, 
a Google for instance, I, I watched this interesting TED talk by Eli Pariser, I think I'm pronouncing that right, and it's called Filter Bubble, and he talks about how he uses an example of some uh, someone that searches for Egypt, for example, and they and they and the, the search results return, uh, you know, all these pyramids and tourist destinations and so on. And then somebody else searches for it, and there's all this stuff about the unrest and you know, uh, Twitter revolution, whatever. You know, so what they, but that that is determined by you know, the the other choices that that user has made in their browsing history, right? So, you know, a company like Google is actually, like, narrowing things if you let it. I mean, you can do, like, the, uh, what is it called, incognito browsing, where it doesn't track your movements. And so, you know, your move, your results in Google are being filtered by your actions. So it ends up being kind of this weird, I don't know. I think that, that there's a lot of value to having kind of journalistic integrity. We end up with these echo chambers if we don't, and that's, that's why you have all these people that listen to Rush Limbaugh on one side, all these people that go to the Huffington Post on the other side. We also have a social network, too, because our bubbles are filtered. Yeah, yeah we filter that's friends. exactly right. So we see right. news and information that reinforces our opinions and everything. Right. What we're and the education about. system is not doing a good job of letting people learn how to discern for themselves either, so you have this sort of perfect storm of things happening. People like being it's challenged, feel like being comfortable. <laughs> There's just more noise now. I feel like we kind of filter our way through it the way we did before the internet, but there's just more things to kind of, yeah. yeah. There's just, I think it, it's just, it's, it's even, it's even more crucial now to make sure that my English professor always said, be sure you have your crap detector on, you know? <laughs> and I think that's, it's, it's something that I've, I've always, I don't know, like I'm, I always feel like I'm, the, I'm one of the most, um, Optimistic, pessimistic people that exist. But it's like you just, you know, you, you just want to be questioning the stuff that's being put in front of you. But there's more of it now, and so it's just about navigating these sea of voices. But it's still, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna, it's, it's as you said, it's the different tribes. You're gonna gravitate to that, and you're gonna like, oh, this person likes this thing. I really trust this person's, you know, opinion, and and you want to follow that too. And so it just, it just seems a lot more mushy now. But you can navigate it. In the beginning, it was about access. Now it's about filtration. Yeah, it's true. And garbage in is garbage out. <laughs> you know. And also, just like hiding things on your Facebook wall is really fun. <laughs> it's very empowering. Yeah. I don't want to see any more like this. Gone. <laughs> it works. I'm completely addicted to Pinterest, and so I allow myself only one time a day for X amount of minutes, and that's all I'm allowed to do. I will just filter. It helps to really avoid the people who pop up like, oh, if you yeah. make, oh, you might like this too. No, no, I might not. I I'm just go like. for what I like, and I know I I search for the kinds of content that I want to see that is going to help me with my job, with my my personal interests, all of that. So it's about it's about using these these um, these channels um, and and learning how to curate for what you want to see. And it goes back to producing, I think in some ways, producing what you want to put out there in the world, you have to filter what you want to take in at the same time. So I would just like to thank Kate and Josh for inviting me to participate in this. And thank you again for hosting this, this conversation. And thank you everybody. Thanks for coming. <laughs>